Welcome to the Desi Books Discourse brought to you by Desi Books. Our discourse topic today is food and food writing as a social justice and resistance tool. I'm the panel host, Mother Shikhosh. With me, I have authors and activists, Anjali and Jerry and Aruni Kashyap. Anjali and Aruni, welcome. And let's talk a little bit about you and your work. Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Anjali, and I'm so excited to be here. Um, I am uh, the author of Southbound Essays on Identity, Inheritance, and Social Change, and the novel Departed Earth that were both released last year. Uh, as Madhushri mentioned, uh, I am a also a community organizer. Uh, I organize in the Asian American community here in Georgia. Hi everyone, uh, it's lovely to be here. My name is Aruni Kashyap. I live in Athens, Georgia, and I'm from Assam in India. And I am a um, primarily a fiction writer, but I have also written poetry. So my recent book is called, uh, it's a poetry collection called There Is No Good Time for Bad News. And uh, the recent fiction collection is called His Father's Disease. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to talk, talk, to, talk to all of you today and especially celebrate Madhu Sri Kosh's book. Thank you so much. All right, let's talk about this. So we're talking about food and food writing as a social justice and resistance tool. Um, in order for us to do that, let's talk about you know, what food represents to us, uh, how we cook, consume, and share, and what does it mean to resist? So I'll start with Anjali. Tell us what you think. You know, uh, food has always been, and I, and I suppose I'm a typical South Asian in this respect, food has always been the primary form of communication in my family and in my community. It is the primary way to nurture uh, loved ones and to receive love from loved ones. Um, and it is, the, it is a way to preserve history especially that ancestral history where our folks are no longer here with us. And we are using food as a tool to sort of uh, reawaken our memories um, and reawaken our family stories. And um, it's been especially vital for me, I think, as a mixed race woman. I'm, I'm half Indian and a quarter Puerto Rican and a quarter Austrian. And um, I feel uh, it's very difficult for me to juggle the culture and the traditions of three families at once. And if all else fails, I have food and I have dishes and I have memories with people sharing in the food, being cooked for, and then cooking for my own children. Um, so, I mean, to put it really simply, food is very much a part, uh, a central part of my identity, and, and it's how I understand um, my community and my heritage. That, that's, that's a very good point. Aruni, did you want to add to that? Sure. Um, yeah, I would say that food has been an amazing connecting tool to build community for me. Uh, and I think queer people, we choose our own community. So when I have moved to different places, uh, different cities, it is through food and sharing food and stories about food that I have built community, built my own chosen family. That is one major way I actually, food plays a role in my life. The other thing is, of course, uh, I have lived away from my home in Assam since I was 17 years old, 18 years old. So as a, uh, in a way to keep Assam alive, I had to sort of consume, cook, and, and source its food. So it was, and, and, and that became a, 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 not only a resolution of identity, but also um, relieving memories, good memories. I think food is also for me, something that preserves memories that also kind of helps me relieve memories. So it's kind of both ways that way. I'm not a food writer, but I have written a lot about food in my in my fiction. They form a major role in my fiction. Uh, they form they form major spaces in my fiction, and I think that goes into say, say that I am a big food lover. And and more importantly, I also love. Um, cooking food, but especially for others. So if you're my friend, you're in luck. Uh, I usually don't like cooking only for myself, you know, but I love to sort of feed people. And I think that's because I have grown up in a very big family, even though I grew up in Guwahati, which is a, a largest city in Assam, but a um, lot of the time I spent in the villages where we, we had, um, 
at least 30 people in our in the same living in the same house and and um, and food was a very important part of connecting and living together sharing and and uh, that's why i think um uh, it's 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 just played a really absolutely important role in my life of course I, I think if you're really looking at it from the scientific perspective, and I'll always bring science into this equation, is, uh, you know, uh, my book is Kabar. So Kabar literally means food. Um, and I'm, I'm slowly changing the Western world by introducing more Bengali words out there without italicizing them. So that's also resistance, in my opinion. But I feel like, you know, when you're talking about food, you're talking about comfort. Food in itself is comfort. And it actually, it actually, memories give you the you know, happy, happy uh, hormones in your head, just like, just like if you fall in love, the first, uh, first tinge of love gives you this good feeling. Food does the same thing. Why? Because it reminds you back of the childhood. But in addition, it's how your mother gave it to you or your father brought food from wherever, or you sat down with your aunt and she taught you how to cook. So for, for South Asian communities like us, we, as kids, we spent a lot of time in the kitchen just getting in people's way we would just get in people's way, but that's how you get it. And I've, I've always said this, I never cooked Bengali food till my parents died. And after they died, um, you know, I suddenly realized I had lost all that knowledge. And it was interesting that, you know, I knew that my mother used to make this cauliflower curry and I knew she added something, but I didn't know what she added. And it was almost like magic. And you can talk mistress of spices, Aruni, but it was like magic that I could actually get back to, uh, cooking it the way she did. Um, so uh, is it muscle memory? Is it what we remember? But I think it's more that you're, you're, you knew what it was, you just didn't know that you knew it. I think too, what I loved about your book is how you wrote about food as one of the most important inheritances that we can have, right? I mean, there are the physical things in the world that don't matter once we've passed on, right? Like, you yeah. know, uh, whatever, money, furniture, books. Well, books, I would argue, probably do matter. <laughs> but, but it's our food ways, I think, um, that that really fill some of the loss. I mean, you know, I, I love in your book how you write about how preparing food and growing food actually, it's a process of mourning and grieving for you now that they're no longer here. And then you have this added urgency of not having them in your ear telling you, okay, these are the ingredients and you know, these are the proportions that you need, these are the measurements for the for the for the recipe. Um, and and so it's just was beautiful for me to read how you recreate. You not only you, you know use the memories to create the food, but you almost use the food to create new memories with your parents who are no longer here. And that was such a poignant um aspect of your book, I think, and one that I had not really thought about or reflected on much um, and, until I read it in your pages. Thank you. Well, I also feel like, you know, we go through trauma. All of us go through different forms of trauma. I mean, my trauma is not yours and yours isn't mine. But in order for us to go through life with joy, with love, with peace, with supporting each other, uh, we need to continue to talk about that trauma. But create better memories. On top of that, our brain is, is, is really a hard drive. And so are you erasing it or are you writing, overriding it? That's what you have to understand in terms of memories. And I think food does a great job of creating new memories that you want to latch on to or you think is more important or actually respects what you lost. Um, so in terms of that, let's talk a little bit about uh, social resistance or social justice when it comes to food. And I know we are all South Asian uh, American authors here, but um, do we want to start with South Asia and then move on to the global world? Let's talk a little bit about that. Aruni, I'll, I'll direct it to you. Uh, you know, um, have, I grew up reading a lot of South Asian or rather say Indian literature in the languages because I grew up in India. And one of, the, one of my favorite writers is a Bengali writer called Asha Puna Devi, who, who is known to have written on more than 179 novels and 3,000, nearly 3,000 short stories. Uh, and she's one of the most prolific writers of her generation, wrote, had a career of 70 years. Um, in her novels, uh, obviously I have not read all of them, you know, but <laughs> I read a lot of them. In her novels, I saw how, especially among upper caste uh, Brahmin widows, 
um, food was used to control women, especially women who were widows. Uh, and because after widowhood, uh, you could not eat a certain kind of food and you could not uh, eat after the sunset. And there are numerous rules and regulations. I saw the similar kind of uh, narratives also in the novels of Indira Goswami, for example, who is an Assamese writer of uh, wide international repute. And in her novel, The Moth Eaten Howda of a Tusker, I saw for the first time that the plight of upper caste um, widows in India were extremely horrible compared to say lower caste uh, uh, or, or, or as we say general caste uh, uh, widows because they had comparatively more freedom because they had to join the workforce, work in the fields, but the upper caste women uh, and rich women, they were controlled, they were not allowed to get out even to the living room, they always had to live on the back side of the house, uh, you know, and, and in the untaste poor as they say, and, and, and food was one of the major ways through which actually they were controlled, but but there's also food through which they rebelled by eating food that was forbidden to them. For example, there is this film called, um, this novel in Mothit and Hada of Tusker, which is also adapted to a national award-winning film called Odajjo, which means that cannot be burnt. Uh, in that, Giribala, the character, she is so young and she's not allowed to eat meat, she's not allowed to eat uh, oil, she's not allowed to eat any kind of like, you know, non-vegetarian materials, which are huge, huge, um, which play a huge role in the East. You know, we love non-vegetarian food. So once there is a, um, uh, there is a kind of a religious or function organized in her house and she goes to the kitchen and starts uh, eating with her hand from a huge cauldron of mutton curry. And she eats nonstop until people actually find her and subject her to very brutal punishment for doing that. But she was only in her teens and she was widowed, you know, and she was craving to eat this good food that was, the smell of it was wafting in the air and she was she was denied from for, for, for the rest of her life, she can't eat those food. So, uh, I think I think food we, we there's so much to celebrate about food and we started with that but I wanted to bring to bring bring to attention this dark side also how food traditionally has been used to oppress subjugate and control women uh, so much especially in upper caste Brahmin families. No, I agree with you. I think another essay that um, food writer Mayuk Sen wrote about was about his family member who actually, a grandmother, I think, who actually was subject to exactly what, what you just mentioned, which is uh, different rules that, that, that we create in our caste society, in a Hindu caste society, that uh, a lot of us take for granted because that's what you assume your grandmothers or your aunts or widowed people uh, in your family to, to be part of. Uh, that is also another way of by which people are controlled, especially women are controlled because most of the women who were widowed in the olden golden days were very young uh, because their husbands may have been extremely old and then they died of old age, but you know, you have younger women stay. And so, so it was a way of making them so-called ugly, unattractive and weak. And this was a very good way to control, uh, control them uh, through food. Um, Anjali, do you want to add to that? You're on mute. Sorry about that. Those are great answers. Um, and I don't have much to add, but just generally, I'm, I'm, you know, food has always been such an important tool to assert identity under colonialism. Um, and even in a post-colonial world, right? Even, even, even since, uh, you know, the United States pulls out of whatever country that, you know, the British pull out of, of the Indian subcontinent. Um, and food has been a way to sort of reassert an identity. And food writing is actually rewriting history. Um, you know, if you are not part of, uh, of the dominant culture, not only are, are your foods being erased, but the history of your foods, the recipes are being erased. And what I love about so much of the writing coming from, say, the diaspora community, but also from the Black community, um, uh, it is this sort of reestablishment of, of true history of where so many of our foods come from. Um, I'm thinking about Michael Twitty's book, The Cooking Gene, which basically reads like a US history book, even though it's technically a food memoir slash food history book. Um, it's almost like a biography of, of food, um, food that was cooked by 
enslaved people, right? Uh, I mean, people who were enslaved were uh, kidnapped and erased and cut off completely from their histories um, and, and uh, lived in bondage. But, but uh, this, they produced a rich food culture that was essentially co-opted, right, by colonizers and and um, made into their own. Um, I, uh, Osai Endelin is a freelance writer and author who also writes about this here. Um, and um, and even you know when I'm thinking about um, other other food stories and food histories, um, Lisa Ling has a, a series out called Takeout Now that that. Uh, again, it's it's telling the story of food, but it's really telling the story of Asian American history that has been completely erased um, in non Asian countries. Um, so, um, so I feel like I feel like food in the the form of resistance serves as testimony. It serves as a witnessing of food ways that are constantly being. Um, you know, uh, categorized and boxed in and erased um, by imperialist powers um, and really depriving communities of their rich histories and identities in the process. And, um, and I'm so grateful to be living in this moment where not only are people cooking, but um, folks are really paying attention to how food sort of unspools a history that had been um, buried um, from 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 you know the beginning of time, and 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 now we're we're understanding um, culture and we're understanding customs and traditions through food, which is really a beautiful thing. Another think, book. Sorry, go ahead, Aruni. I just want to say one sentence. Another book that I just finished reading and I forgot to mention is *The Nutmeg's Curse* by Amitabh Ghosh. Mm. And it is amazing yes. and extremely subversive, a radical book, I think, uh, because it talks about how uh, it talks about the story of colonialism just through the story of the how the nutmeg was conquered in the in the in the in, in the Banda Islands in, in the nation archipelago. Um, I just don't want to reveal any. And I mean, if we all know the story, but Ghosh weaves the narrative in such an astonishing way with so much erudition and so much narrative technique that it's fascinating just to read how the nutmeg could be seen as a not the story of the conquering of the nutmeg from the Banda Islands in Indonesia could be seen as a template of the modern story of colonialism leading to capitalism, leading to coronavirus, you know, and all of this the human greed. Um, so I would recommend one of those, one of that book as well, along the along with the roster of Kabar, the nutmeg scores, and the books that Anjali has just recommended. Thank you. Well. The other book that I thought I should add to that is uh, Nina Mukherjee, uh, Forstenau's book, Green Chili and Other Imposters. And it really takes us through Bengal and the kind of food that we consider our, our um, Indian or Bengali, but actually came from elsewhere. So for example, um, anybody from Kolkata will know about Tangra and the Tangra Chinese food and why it exists the way it does. But, but there were, you know, Chinese uh, families who moved there, either they were kicked out or they came there for business and and became uh, became part of Kolkata, part of India. The food is very, very it's it's similar to Sichuan, but it's very different in the sense it, it's very typical Tangra. And anybody who's listening to this, you know what I'm talking about if you know if you've been there. Um, interestingly, uh, most of the uh, the Chinese Indians there uh, are. Uh, Kali Bhakts, or or they worship uh, the goddess Kali, Kali the destroyer, Kali the badass feminist, in my opinion. Um, and so it's it's interesting how culture changes, morphs, but they are also resisting what what uh, they are considered in India, because as as we all know, um, the the general population myself included, is very racist. We are very racist about where we come from. We are very racist about our color. We are very racist about our caste. We are very racist about our religion. If we don't acknowledge that, you cannot acknowledge how food has influenced that decision also. 
where you have things like that's Muslim food or that's Hindu food or that's low caste food or that's high caste food. And uh, Nina has done a very good job in uh, her book. Uh, she, she's my editor, so I really love what she's done. But more importantly, she comes from the Food Story Network for University of Iowa Press, and they're coming up with some amazing social justice books. I so, love that you mention the, uh, you know, food is a way to also sort of perpetuate racism and casteism. I think that's so important, right? I mean, we have the classic way of people asserting their Brahmanism by talking about how they're vegetarian. Yes. You know? <laughs> and, yes. and, you know, I often, when I often read essays, um, food essays, one of the things that sort of keys me in to this sort of complicity, I think, in, in, in caste is, is when uh, Brahmin writers will not identify themselves as Brahmin, but make it very clear that they're vegetarian and preparing vegetarian dishes and, and talk about how vegetarianism is a tradition in their family and they've always been vegetarian and raised vegetarian without any sort of deeper acknowledgement about power and oppression and how their food is derived directly from that, right? Uh, uh, derived from oppressing others and and how probably the food is not even being cooked by them, but uh, someone from a lower caste, right? Especially if it's happening and if, if we're talking about writing from the subcontinent. So um, it, it's interesting to me how we can both sort of deconstruct and dismantle, um, you know, the patriarchy and other forms of oppression and racism, but also use food writing to uphold those systems of power. Um, and, and in fact, you know, continue the violence um, by asserting, you know, our, our own privilege in our writing without interrogating it. No, you bring up a very good point. I think Sharanya Deepak is an amazing food writer. And I know we're talking about books, but I would encourage all of us to read essays in multiple different um, magazines and journals. Whetstone Magazine is one of them. Um, but she wrote an essay in Popula, uh, P-O-P-U-L-A, um, about Dalit, that there is no such thing as Dalit cuisine. And the reason being, uh, the, the oppressed, the underprivileged, uh, the marginalized people, Dalit people, had to make do with whatever they got. And it's very similar to what's happened in the Black uh, cuisine, Black culture. You're basically getting the dregs of what you have. So you will have to make it better. You have to make it taste better in order to make it edible. So, uh, you know, I get this question a lot about, you know, you know, vegetarianism is better, but you, you really, my book starts off with fish and, you know, why that's important. And it's not, it, it has nothing to do with cost, but it has everything to do with privilege. I was able to go get fish, right? I was able to go uh, with my father and, and go to the market and pick up a fish that, that anybody else wouldn't be able to. But even then there is a class to it. As you said, Anjali, even then there is a class to it in terms of, I'm not talking about vegetarianism. Uh, this is my culture. This is where I come from. Uh, but also, also there are people who've actually taken parts of, of animals that we don't usually eat. And we don't eat, but they do because that's where, that's where, that's all they got. So uh, if we don't acknowledge our privilege when we talk about food writing, uh, especially as a food writer, I think I would be doing everybody a disservice. Uh, if I did, so. Adding to what Anjali said about Brahminism and vegetarianism, uh, anybody who says that within India will be laughed at because that's the wrong information, <laughs> you know. Uh, um, it's only a few communities of Brahmins who don't eat non-vegetarian food. Uh, everywhere else, I know my friends and, and uh, you know, I know I've lived in different parts of India. It's a very common thing for upper caste Brahmins to eat uh, meat. Uh, so it's, again, a very, very small fraction of people who have a very loud platform probably <laughs> can say that, you know, yeah, and, and perpetuate this idea that Brahminism and vegetarianism go together. For, for instance, you know, um, uh, you, you, in the East, you cannot do Durga Puja or Kali Puja without uh, actually animal sacrifice, which is consumed as consecrated food after. 
Oh, certainly. I mean, I'm talking about kind of specific food writers. I know who yes. the vegetarianism is very much tied to their Brahmin identity. Yes. But who choose not to reveal that as yeah. part of what is meant to be a deeply probing essay about food and identity and food history, but then leaves out kind of this prong of, of you know, what is underneath that, right? What is the power structure that is there? Um, but I, I also think too, you know, um, a lot of these sort of systems of power come, come into play with respect to food reviews, right? Reviewing a new restaurant um, and uh, how class uh, affects how certain, you know, the, the amount of space that um, food reviews get for sort of the corner mom and pop uh, built up from nothing uh, authentic, say, South Asian restaurant versus the, you know, on Fifth Avenue, uh, you know, or in, in Silicon Valley, the sort of second, third generation um, say Indian American, upper class, upper caste, who then opens a restaurant and gets all of this publicity and coverage and um, reviews with large uh, number of words in a paper of record. Um, and, and so it's it's been, it's, an, it's a different sort of way to think about food and power and resistance. Um, and I feel like this is getting a little bit better that, that you know, the, the low income immigrant communities are starting to be seen more by mainstream media and get the kind of more thoughtful reviews other than just like a blurb and some publication of the fact of their opening. Um, I, I, I feel like maybe this is becoming a little, little bit more equitable, um, but you know, we have a history of food reviews being written uh, as, you know, a, a, a particular culture's food cast in a sort of very, you know, capitalistic white supremacist light in order to get page space for, you know, an interview with the chef or a review of that restaurant. Um, and so yeah. I would love to see that become more equitable, that change to happen where we're we're seeing, we, we are publicizing, we are writing deep, you know, deeply about new restaurants, new food ways from communities that um, do not, are not as privileged as, uh, as other folks who, who, uh, you know, get into the food business. So uh, I'm going to challenge that a little bit because I feel like it's not happening. And that's what concerns me significantly. Um, uh, a lot of us have written about Garima Kothari. Uh, she was a chef in New York and uh, she uh, started the, um, the restaurant called Nukkar. Uh, she, she had a Calcutta, um, um, Calcutta upbringing and then, uh, you know, uh, but, uh, from the business class. And she, she gave up her investment banking work to move into uh, culinary school. And then uh, she started this and right around the pandemic, it was five weeks um, up and then she had to close it down. And then in April, uh, it was a uh, domestic partner abuse uh, situation where she was murdered by her husband. And, um, and that received a lot of attention amongst us of the South Asian community. But again, Mayuk had written about this. I had written about this, uh, that she was trying her best to get funding. She was trying to get New York to fund. And the problem was, people were, the, the restaurants that were being given the, the money were the pizza joints, the salad joints, uh, the easily accessible, not very exotic joints. Um, and so, you know, I'd love to see, and I'd love, I'd love to hope that we are actually paying attention to what's happening in our community and actually talking about it. Um, but we need to have more people get more agitated about it because this was a domestic abuse situation. South Asian, in the South Asian community, we have over 40% of women uh, who experience domestic uh, violence in this country. And we don't talk about that. And when you look at it from the food perspective, it's even more so. Um, for someone to be murdered when you're five months pregnant uh, means that you were attacked prior to that. This is not the first time that this happened. So I know I'm bringing the conversation down a little bit, but I think people need to understand food 
violence and the dark side of food is also very, very uh, convoluted and very uh, present in uh, our current writing. And if we don't talk about that, nobody will know. And that's what the model immigrant situation is for us, that you know, we're not supposed to talk about it. We are fine. All we do is, uh, you know, parathas and, and uh, saag paneer. That's what we do. And that's what we talk about. But there's so much to us besides that, the good and the bad. And I think food, food is, look, I mean, we are taught when we are raised that we are to serve food, right, to our partners, and that that is essential part of our relationship. And so uh, while food is, is, is a very, you know, it's, it's an empowering uh, source of the spirit, it, in that sense, we start to become disempowered, right? You exist to serve food to your, you know, usually it's, it's a male, it's a husband, right? You exist, you know, you should let uh, prepare the plate first, eat second if you have to. I mean, this is very much a part of our culture. And I think it would be wonderful if more food writers like yourself um, got, you know, started talking about the the, the ties between food and intimate partner violence um, and, and how in some ways, you know, food can be liberation. But in other ways, food can keep us uh, in danger, right? It can endanger us. It can be, it's such an obligation on us to serve and to cook food and to cook the best food, right? Multiple dishes that it becomes a burden and one that makes us feel maybe tied to an unsafe situation because we've been taught that the way you show love is through food. But on the flip side of that, when the relationship is toxic, the, you know, this way that you're supposed to show love ends up becoming something that that um, is unsafe and unhealthy and something that, you know, one needs to break away from. Um, but the food feels like such a, an obligation in a relationship that it's it's hard to do that. You bring up a good point. It's um, but I think maybe we should just change the topic a little bit. We are a little bit towards appropriation. How about we talk a little bit about I mean, there, there are different ways uh, people of color have been talking about food, writing about food, um, but maybe we should talk about allies. Let's talk about allies and allied food writing. Uh, is that happening? Do we think it's happening and is it happening well? Uh, this is not a place where we are sitting here and saying us versus them. This is a place where we really want to constructively understand what are people doing and what could they do better? So Aruni, do you want to start? Um. I don't know actually much about this uh, this question, so maybe I would throw it back to the both of you. What you had in mind, and if I have something, I would surely come and add. add. Absolutely, Anjali. I know you and I talked about this. You know, it's interesting because I think when I think of allyship, I think about two things. One is, what are you doing to sort of highlight voices that are are marginalized, right? Um, but then two, what does the sort of financial and economic model look like? So if you're an ally, but you always get prime space about your food writing in the New York Times, and you're never actually giving that space to an up and coming low income immigrant writer, um, you know, what does allyship actually mean? Um, I feel like someone who more often than not got it right was Anthony Bourdain because um, in his role um, as a food writer, he seemed to be more as a ally, I suppose is one word, but you know, also an ethnographer, right? He almost erased himself in the storytelling of food that did not belong to him, food that he was not familiar with. Um, and certainly he was not perfect, but you know, when you read his food writing, you know, when you, when you, when you see his show, Parts Unknown, what you find is he was one of the few white writers to talk to, you know, the kitchen staff that was often invisibilized, right? He didn't just sit down with the chefs who have their name on the neon sign, right? He was talking to the dishwashers. He was talking to, uh, you know, the sous chefs. He was talking to the people mopping the floor. I mean, so, um, and, and, and not just talking to them, but sort of 
centering their needs and their contributions in the greater sort of food industry. Um, and and while, while BIPOC communities have been doing that from the beginning, um, it was refreshing that that someone who was not a part of the low income BIPOC or immigrant community, you know, was actually doing this, was actually providing a model. I mean, what we've seen, oh gosh, on social media is is a lot of these white writers writing about um, cultures that don't belong to them, but then crying about cancel culture afterwards. I mean, it's 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 unbelievable just just for being criticized on how they erased a culture in writing about a food, right? Act, you know, they're they're Columbusing, right? They're like discovering a dish that sounds a lot like chole, <laughs> you know, or, or something, <laughs> right? It's like, it's like, oh my gosh, I added, you know, whatever curry leaves to these this potato dish and coriander seeds and look what it came up with, right? Um, so um, so it's interesting to me that he was around for a while while we were lucky enough to have him. He was around for a while doing it a much better way that really effectively demonstrated allyship. And yet I feel like there are not a ton of food writers who've sort of adapted his methodology, right? Um, I, I feel like um, something was really lost when he died. And I, and I think that's why a lot of BIPOC food writers really mourned when he passed because, um, because his ways of telling food stories that did not belong to him did not really sort of uh, uh, disperse and, and um, they were not embraced by a lot of other white food writers. Um, and I, I mean, it's, it, it was a real, it's a real shame because, um, you know, uh, there, there's been no real attempt, I think, to learn how to be an ally in food writing, right? Which sometimes looks, looks, uh, is simply just interviewing somebody, right? Like you don't need to write the food essay about a food that doesn't belong to your people. You can just highlight them, right? Interview them. You can write a food review about you know, they're, they're a restaurant. There are so many ways you can actually be a good ally, um, but it's not, I, I feel like it's not really happening to the degree that it should be in 2022. Yeah, and I think, I think what, what Anjali was saying, uh, uh, just to add to that, I think he made also a lot of people like us seen by, by centering them. And that's why so many people from around the world actually mourned, uh, mourned him so much because they, they felt seen by him and valued by him where he took a backstage, but also was the participant and facilitator of the knowledge. I also see that a lot in the West, not necessarily only in, in the United States, but I see a lot in the West is actually people who are products of people who are from the global South or definitely from South Asia, who are products of like very sort of traditional white knowledge systems. They also end up sort of uh, appropriating or Columbusing in some ways. And what I feel is that maybe they are making something Indianish or Bangladeshish or Pakistanish, you know, uh, which are actually part of probably the culture of the country that they have grown up in. And it could be British or America or Canadian, uh, which borrows motifs from, say, India, but not necessarily, you know, uh, the, the 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 not necessarily Indian food. So I'm saying that we can actually we should also start thinking about these categories because Indo Chinese is now an almost seen as an independent category, right? I think Chinese don't want to claim in the Chinese because it is so far, so, so far removed from, from Chinese food, you know? Like I actually buy Indian soy sauce, by the way, because that's the soy sauce I kind of really enjoy. Um, but the I think- salt. I, it's yes, salt. the salt and the darker <laughs> soy sauce, pink soy sauce actually, especially. So I think we need to think about all those categories uh, that, that a lot of the food bloggers or the food writers that we see these days who, trace their roots back to India or South Asia, are they actually creating a version of American food by borrowing motifs or actually doing Indian food? Because what is happening is that the, the it, it also ends up erasing the original cultures in some ways, you know? And we can see parallels of that sometimes in literature as well, you know, where we erase the uh, writers of uh, Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, Bengali languages 
when we can replace them with somebody who writes about those cultures, but in English. So I think these kind of parallels can must be studied and definitely highlighted so that we can have a much more robust conversation about this and enri enrich conversation, actually. I love that point, Aruni, and I feel like there is such an easy way to write about um, food while acknowledging that you this isn't an authentic dish to its origins. Like just being honest about how a particular dish came about, what were the forces in your life to create this dish? Well, I'm third generation Sri Lankan and I never knew any of my relatives and I've never visited Sri Lanka, but what I've created is from stories I've heard that by no means is an authentic Sri Lankan dish, but uh, it's tasty. And for me, it symbolizes, like there's so many ways to situate food writing, right? Beautiful. To actually Beautiful. acknowledge all of the forces, yes. but that's not done, unfortunately, right? Beautiful. You know, you can always put a disclaimer about, you know, I don't want to erase the food, you know, but, I did create this dish, which is important to me. And let me tell you how it came about. That's all we, you know, that's all we need to do really. And I would be a fan of anybody who says that like, oh my God, you are yeah. so humble. You're so, yeah. you know, you're so humble. You're making that nod, you know, uh, I, and that's really important. And you are creating something new. These three, I've been already three, three plus points. Yeah, so thank you, thank was, you for saying that. That was a uh, Twitter, uh, kerfuffle over this is that I would like to read, uh, and I shouldn't remember who said it, but I think it was Sukhadwala. Um, and uh, basically, I would like to read somebody's essay or somebody's recipe where they say, you know, I just threw these things together and Googled and figured out something. I didn't have this grandmother or aunt or mother <laughs> teaching me of this, you know, um, which, which is a lot of us have learned how to cook that way. If we came here in our early 20s, we had no idea. We were never in the kitchen. So uh, I feel that's going to happen. But what, what I feel is happening lately, especially amongst non-people of color, is that um, the awareness of acknowledgement is not there. They don't even understand that they may have appropriated. And that, I think, is even more dangerous. It's even more dangerous because they, they really actively believe that they created this dish, right? So if Columbus found us, then it must be solved. It must be and, so. And I think editors, right? There's a problem at the editorial level as well. Yes. Like editors need to be able to really look at a pitch and determine, is this someone who actually is writing, you know, about an authentic dish that exists, that is what is popular in that culture? I mean, I, 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 I'm not a food writer, but I've said this many, many times. My father is a workaholic, what worked so many hours when I was growing up. My mother is not Indian. So she, when I was growing up, she made, she would, we would visit India, my grandmother's house, and she would do the best she could to replicate my grandmother's dishes, but couldn't. Um, is it Indian cooking? It is my, my, my white presenting mother's best attempt to create my grandmother's South Indian dishes. It is imperfect. But there's a beauty in that love, right? There's a beauty in what a white presenting mom tries to do to give her children the dishes. But, and also an admission that this isn't it, right? And so I'm then the next generation who, you know, doesn't remember anything from my grandmother who learned some Indian cooking, right? Which from my mother who, who didn't really learn the authentic dishes. But that is also an important food story, right? But we have to be honest. We have to be truth tellers and acknowledge, you know, to an editor who might solicit a piece of writing, oh, you don't want my alu matar, right? You don't even want my chai. I can't even make authentic chai. I've tried it many, many times. It doesn't taste anything like what I remember though, right? Um, but, but, but I think it would be so wonderful to have these, have food writers write in such a way where they acknowledge their very imperfect, ambiguous food histories in a way that doesn't then take away space in a publication that could actually also go to somebody who is truly writing about their authentic dishes. Well, I think it's also 
And you bring up a good point because what's happening now is we have been living outside of India for India and South Asia rather for many generations. There have been lots of different blends of us, right? So, so now the question comes about what is really authentic. You know, what do we consider authentic? I think you know the Tangra uh, chili chicken is very authentic, but you know I talk to my Chinese friends and they they do not think so. Um, but what I think we also need to look at is um, not just in food writing, but how do we present ourselves as, as a people? How do we present ourselves? And we present ourselves in Bollywood, we present ourselves in movies, we present ourselves in, in you know, the Dandia dance or what, you know, in any festival that, that, we, um, that we present ourselves in. And so um, the appropriation there too is very interesting. The classism in Bollywood movies is also very interesting. The kind of foods we eat is very interesting. One movie that I want to talk about, and I think people, when they talk about food writing, should talk about move, food and movies too. One, one movie I'd like to talk about that I don't think gets enough attention is a movie called Akoni. Um, and it's, it's about this meat dish that this girl from the northeastern part of the country is trying to make in New Delhi in a, as a paying guest, uh, and that's a meat that people don't eat, and the kind of things she has to do in order to generate that dish, because that represents her culture, and yet it's looked down upon elsewhere. Um, I think that was one of the very few movies that I've seen that have addressed, um, you know, discrimination at this level when it comes to food. I'd love to talk a little bit about uh, Bollywood. Um, I know Anjali's like, no, I don't want to talk about Bollywood, but I'm sure we can, we can talk a few uh, words about it. I would, love, I would love to listen to you both talk about it because I don't know enough about it. To talk about. <laughs> um, just a point about Akhoni. I really have forgotten, forgotten what, are my, what are my problems with Akhoni were. Uh, um, you know, I think there was too much catering to the mainland sort of, yes. uh, uh, sort of uh, you know, um, what do I say? Um, there was a lot of attempt to sort of placate and and make the mainlanders understand that we are also human beings. And I thought that was kind of uh, a little sad, you know, in, in Akhoni. But I do, I have faced discrimination. I have been thrown out of, uh, of, of rented properties in Delhi for, uh, yeah. because they thought I would possibly quick cook Akhoni. Because, you mm. know, Akhoni actually is, is, has a very strong smell. We, we all love it. But I think they, uh, I was, I, I remember, and that's a different story, but I was denied after I signed the contract. Uh, the people said that up looks, it's a kind of an anger, which you'll make all this kind of smelly food, so we can't let you all. And they, they also said that you'll cook a pork, so we can't let you stay in our house. So, and that's very common, by the way. So the the discrimination that you see in Akhoni and quite a few few very horrifying instances of discrimination uh, uh, is very true. But I also felt that um, the movie was um, it's a good conversation starter, I would say. You know, but it had a lot of problems, and I remember being very offended by many of the things that depicted. You know, that are kind of yeah. So, but anyway, but I, that's a different conversation altogether. But I, but you know, I mean, uh, you're talking about Bollywood and food. I think food becomes such a I mean, it's there in everywhere in every Bollywood movie. Food is such a huge part of it, actually. Um, I, um, I, I think, I think that's because in any fictional world, I think it's not complete without actually the presence of uh, extensive amount of reference to food, especially when it comes to South Asia, probably. You know, because food, be we have. We have food for every occasion, right? This is what you cook in a in a wedding. This is what you cook in a in a in a bishu or bihu. This is what you cook in Durga Puja. This is what you cook one day after Holi. So we have all of those different specific kind of food. I think that's why I think um, in any kind of fictional um, uh, uh, spaces, and Bali is one of those fictional spaces. Food is indispensable, you know. Yeah, two movies that I'd like to talk about. These are old, old, old movies. One is Mirch Masala and the other one is Manthan. And both of them are movies, um, uh, they're, I would uh, not call them Bollywood movies. I would call them art movies, as we were told. Pita Patil, and, right? Uh, Masala? Sorry? Mirch Masala is Pita Patil, right? Yeah, it's Swita a Patil. very powerful movie. My yeah, God. Swita, if you're really talking about food and food writing or food movies uh, and social justice issues, it, it's about... It's about oppression. It's about how do you rebel and how do you get women to support each other? Um, and uh, Mitch or, or 
chili peppers is, is what, what makes them uh, unite. And if anybody wants to go watch that movie, I would love to read that screenplay because I think it, it, it's an amazing one where everybody is supporting the Smitha Patel character um, when, when this bad guy uh, is making eyes at her and how they rescue her and how she rescues herself from this oppression. Manthan is another uh, movie um, that, that's an art movie. Um, and Manthan means something to churn, how you churn. So the, the milk that you get, you churn to make butter out of that. And so uh, this was also, uh, uh, I think a national film uh, movie. Um, and it, uh, Smitha Patel again, our art movie queen was in it. And uh, it, it was about milk and how uh, cooperatives in the state of Gujarat uh, were created in order for them to sell the milk to that, that group and earn some money. And um, it's, it's just a fascinating story, but it's also a story about how we oppress and how we, um, people with money are the privileged ones, people with the higher cost are the privileged ones. And I think we need to continue as they see writers keep talking about cost and privilege because caste and privilege has reached us here. If you look at the Cisco case um, against uh, the Dalits and, and the hiring manager who is upper caste, it's here in our corporate America already. So, uh, you know, movies, books, poetry, they all talk about uh, social justice um, in a way that food, just writing about a recipe would not. Yeah. Any final words? Aruni? Um, not, I mean, I'm just, uh, I can just go on and on, on, you know, I think we both, all of us love, love this topic because it is an entry point to so many interesting things, uh, you know, and I think, um, yeah, so thank you for making me think about this, you know, and uh, I'm not a food writer, but I keep talking, I definitely write a lot about food in my, in my fictional, in my, in my novels, in my short stories, uh, so, so I think, and I now it has, I'm thinking now why I do that. And I think I do that because it, it's a kind of assertion of who I am. Uh, it's also a way of remembering how I have have good time, you know, and how I have spent good time in Delhi and Assam before coming here and here as well. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to read your book. You know, I thought it was already published. I wanted to go and buy it. It's, it looks like it is released on a April 4th, 2022. So I'm very excited to read it. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I would want to just thank you for writing the book. Uh, it's, it's wonderful. I've had the pleasure of interviewing you about it. And um, I, I love the sort of way that, you know, it is kind of a, a, a writing about food, writing a memoir, writing about history, uh, of politics. You really have it all in there. And I really hope this is the first in a line of many books that come out of the food writing community that sort of blend discussions about food weights with, with social change and with politics and, and with, um, you know, colonialism. And um, so I, I hope that this is the beginning of a, another wave of, of food writing that goes you know, that writes very deeply and provocatively about food, but also ab about, about people and about identity and culture. Well, I, I certainly don't think I'm the first. I certainly don't hope I'm the last. Uh, there are many writers, we just haven't discovered them, but they're fast and furiously writing. That's my hope. Um, I'll end with Aruni asking you about your favorite dish that you like to make. Oh my God. Oh. I like to make uh, chicken curry. Um, yeah, because I think it's so easy. Uh, most people who are non-vegetarians love it. It's almost like um, treating yourself good to hearty chicken curry with, you know, nice, flavorful. I don't like to use a lot of masala because I didn't use a grow up. I only use ginger garlic paste and onions. That's it. You know, and my mother used to say a good chicken curry uh, needs a lot of love and patience don't hurry it. So cook it slowly. It'll be nutritious. It'll be tasty. And that's what I try to do. You know, when I'm in a hurry, it never turns out very well. But when I cook it in low flame, it turns out very well. The other thing I really love to cook is uh, kheer, which is um, um, rice pudding, as some, some people like to say. And uh, I'm a very, very, I'm a very hurried cook. 
I cook very fast and people are really fascinated how I do it. And I myself, I'm fascinated how I do it. I can cook four dishes in the four burners and it'll be four things will be done in, in one, one hour and I can feed quite a lot of people. I think I've developed this instinctively because I have been a grad student in different, different places. I've been a student in different places. So kiri is something I, cook, I can cook really fast in like 20 minutes. But it is. It always turns out to my to my satisfaction, uh, really well, you know. And um, uh, yeah, I love that very much. Kheer, uh, it's one. Of, it's my favorite thing to do. Fantastic, fantastic, Anjali. Wow. Well, I would never be able to have, maybe that's why it takes me so long to cook is because I'd never be able to have four burners running for food. I, I can do two, possibly three on a good day, uh, but never, never more than that. So, I mean, my my heart food, my comfort food has always been dal. Um, you know, my, my grandmother used to, it was, she used to feed us a whole bunch of different curries on a plate. But then when you were done with your plate, you always were given more dal. And then you finished the doll and then you were given more doll and then you were, gi you were given more doll. And then she would, she would uh, plop the uh, fresh yogurt on your plate to then that was sort of how you washed everything down. But it's, it was always her doll. Um, uh, there are days that I feel like I'm pretty close to how it tasted, how she made it. Um, my father has given me the, the best compliments and he says it actually is better than my grandmother's doll, which was huge for me because uh, I like cooking a lot. It's important to me. It's it's my my love language, but I know I'm not as good as my grandmother. So um, so that really meant a lot for me. But 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 I it's it's a comfort food, um, and it 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 makes me feel like I'm connecting to her uh, in in the same way that looking at photographs does. So um, so yeah, definitely all day long when I am having a bad day, it is. If you ever ask me how my day is going and I tell you I'm making doll for dinner, you know that I am just like needing <laughs> comfort and, and nurturing and I just need to settle down with my, my big plate of doll. That's awesome. I think doll is everybody's comfort food, I think. But, what about uh, your brother, Sri? Your favorite food to cook? Yeah, well, I was just thinking about what you just said about, you know, four burners. I do four burners all the time and that's because my mother used to say um, a woman's uh, place is not in the kitchen, but at the dining table discussing politics. And so, so we would cook as quickly as we could. So we could go to the table and we would all eat together. Um, so I'm, I'm used to cooking fast. Uh, my favorite food is my, what my mother used to make, obviously. And uh, it's luchi alu. Luchi is uh, luchi or puris. And um, alu, you make, you really cut it really small and you add uh, uh, kalonji, uh, uh, Nigella seeds with mm -hmm. tons of uh, dry green, uh, uh, dry red chilies, and tons and tons of turmeric. Um, it is deep fried uh, puris. So anybody who's listening to this and wants to eat um, healthy food, that's not it. But it's comfort food. It's comfort food. It is food that makes you happy. It reminds you of home, and that's all that matters to me. So yeah, that's my deal. And mustard oil probably. Oh, absolutely mustard oil. It's always mustard oil. <laughs> That's another story yes, for another yes, day. Yes. I'm all for mustard oil. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't know, Anjali, if you know about that, but that's a very eastern part of the uh, country thing. Mustard oil, mustard oil is almost like the Windex of of uh, food for us. We'll use it in everything. Sometimes my North Indian friends used to ask, like, you are having alu alu ki sabji, like alu fried in mustard oil with a roti. Like, how? I said, you have no idea how delicious it is. <laughs> And scientifically, it makes a lot of sense because it's got methyl isothiocyanate, which actually is an anti-inflammatory. So it cleans out all your sinuses and it's good for your stomach. So we are sciencing, Arini. <laughs> That's what we are doing. <laughs> I will try it for sure. We were yeah. a big ghee family and it was ghee for everything. And uh, that's, that's what good I too. know. But ghee has other properties. So a topic for another discussion. Thank you both so much. Um, thank you. This, this is, is so fun. I know. Thank you all for watching or listening and join us again later on on Daisy Books Discourse. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.